This is our last lecture. Uh, I want to start by just talking about two of the uh, common mistakes that were made on test two. The most common mistake was students, um, and I'm sure it's just because you're under the pressure of taking an exam, you mixed up the ideas of convergence of sequences and convergence of series. So let's just look. This was one of the, the first one that I asked you uh, to test a series for convergence. Um, a lot of you instead looked at the nth term of the sequence of terms and told me whether that was converging. Well, yes, that goes to zero. But I wanted to know, does the series converge? So the easiest way to have done this is just to remember the theorem that you can split up this sigma a sub n plus b sub n is sigma a sub n plus sigma b sub n if both of those series converge. And they do here. If you split this up into sigma 5 over k squared plus sigma 2 times the square root of k over k squared, you can do this. This is OK to put the equal sign there because both of these series converge. Um, that's equal to sigma 5 over k squared plus sigma 2 over k to the 3 halves. So we can say uh, this, which is equal to this, converges. In other words, the series converges since or because both uh, sigma 5 over k squared and sigma 2 over k to the 3 halves converge. They both are p-series with p greater than 1. So that was the simplest way to look at that. Now, some of you tried to use the comparison test, which was a reasonable thing to try. But it's a little bit difficult, because if I write, let's say, ct here. We're going to try to compare. We can do it, but I hadn't done one like this for you. 5 plus 2 times the square root of k over k squared. Now, you know that the comparison series that you would like to, to compare it to would be sigma. Well, dropping out the stuff that doesn't count much, you would just be left with square root of k over k squared, which is sigma 1 over k to the 3 halves. So this is what you would, oh, I didn't write 3 halves. That's the series that you'd like to compare it to. But I have to make this less than less than a p-series that converges. And I can't just drop out the 5 because it would make it get smaller, not bigger. So instead, I notice this. For k greater than 25, I could say that this, I want to grow it. I'm going to make the numerator a little bit bigger. I'm going to put the square root of k plus 2 times the square root of k over k squared. I can replace 5. I can replace 5 with the square root of k, which I can add to this, as long as k is greater than 25. And we're only concerned with large values of k. So this is equal to, then, 3 over k to the 3 halves. And we know that sigma 3 over k to the 3 halves converges uh, p greater than 1. Therefore, the series converges by the comparison test. Now, again, this is where the comparison test is not so much fun to use, because you have to think of creative ways of growing that numerator. You can't just drop things off like we have been doing. If you did the bonus questions, let me tell you that the limit comparison test avoids this difficulty. You could just say, oh, I want to compare it to sigma b sub n being the comparison series, sigma 1 over k to the 3 halves. You would take the limit of a sub n over b sub n and get convergence. Now, if you had been asked the question, like on the first page of questions, if I had asked you 
to find the limit of the sequence, in other words, does the sequence converge, well, then you would have just taken these, the nth term here, or the kth term, and I'd say, well, the best method, you could, mm, L'Hopital's rule would be a mess. Let's just divide by the most powerful thing, which is k squared. So you'd have 5 over k squared plus 2 over k to the 3 halves all over k squared over k squared. And now you know that 5 over k squared goes to 0 as k goes to infinity, as does 2 over k to the 3 halves. And so we get the limit of the sequence is 0 over 1, which is 0. But this is a completely different question than asking, does the series converge? This just tells us that this sequence of terms in that series does go to zero. And this, I believe, was problem eight. Find a power series representation for this function g of x and give its interval of absolute convergence. Uh, the first thing you had to recognize here, well, let's write g sub x as x times 1 plus x squared to the minus 2. If you wrote it that way, you'd probably see easier that it is a derivative almost, isn't it? In fact, the derivative with respect to x of 1 over 1 plus x squared, or let's write that 1 plus x squared to the minus 1, is equal to minus 1 plus x squared to the minus 2 times 2x. So you see it's almost exactly the same thing. In fact, g of x is minus one-half that derivative. Minus one-half the derivative with respect to x of one over one plus x squared. And we know a series for one over one plus x squared. So I'll do it without using sigma notation first. This would be minus one-half the derivative with respect to x of and we have 1 minus x squared plus x to the fourth minus x to the sixth plus x to the eighth minus and so on. So now let's see, we'll wait on the minus 1 half and let's differentiate term by term. We know that we can do that uh, as long as we x is a value for which the series converges. All right, so this differentiating, the first term disappears, and we have minus 2x plus 4x cubed minus 6x to the fifth plus 8x to the seventh minus, and so on. And taking the derivative then, oh, we took the derivative, now dividing by minus a half. Well, when I multiply by the minus 1, it's going to change all the signs of the terms and then divide by 2. So I'll have plus x minus 2x cubed plus 3x to the fifth minus 4x to the seventh and so on plus dot dot dot. And that's your answer. Now, if I did it all using summation notation, that's fine too. When I saw that it was the derivative here, at this point I would say it is minus one-half, the derivative with respect to x of the sum from k equals zero to infinity of minus one to the n x to the two n. Differentiating term by term, still have my minus one-half on the outside, I'll get, oh, the first term will disappear, so it'll be k equals 1 to infinity, uh, minus 1 to the n, that's just a constant, 2n x to the 2n minus 1, using the power rule on each term. Now multiplying in by minus a half. Well, we've got the sum from k equals 1 to infinity, Dividing by the one-half, well, that'll just give me n, and dividing by another factor, or multiplying by another factor of minus one, I get minus one to the n plus one. I multiply by minus one here, and then divide by two here, and I get n x to the two n minus one. So either one of those answers would have been fine. 
All right, so we're going to go back and review something that we have talked about in two or maybe three of our labs in MAT 164. Uh, and also you saw in Calc 1 briefly, and that was Taylor polynomials. We've seen in lab that they are used to approximate functions uh, near a certain point, x naught. So given a function f of x that is repeatedly differentiable on an interval containing some number x naught, the nth Taylor polynomial for f at x naught, centered at x naught, is, well, let's look at the, you, you can look at this notation, but for, for now, I think this is a good way to look at it. Because what we want to see is how do you form the coefficients of the polynomial. And notice that, oh, by the way, f upper k is the kth derivative at x naught. And if you see f upper 0, that's just the function itself. And we use that so that we can write it all using sigma notation. So notice when k is 0, you have f of x naught over 0 factorial times that to the 0. So you just have f of x naught. When k is 1, we have f upper 1 means f prime at x naught divided by 1 factorial times x minus x naught. If we just go this far, if n is 2, we just have the linear approximation. Okay, but if well, that would be if n is 1, excuse me. Now, if n is 2, we add on another term. The second derivative at x naught divided by 2 factorial times x minus x naught squared. If we just go out three terms, that is uh, where n is equal to 2, we have the quadratic approximation, and so on. There should be a plus here. Um, the nth Taylor polynomial, you go all the way out to the nth coefficient here, is the nth derivative at x naught divided by n factorial times x minus x naught to the n. And we saw that for x close to x naught, that this polynomial was a very good approximation for f of x. In fact, and this we did not go over in class, but it's in Taylor's theorem on page 504. If the next derivative, if the next derivative, for example, if you're just going out to the quadratic approximation, this would be the third derivative. Or if you were going out to the cubic approximation, we'd look at the fourth derivative. If that function is bounded on the, on the interval that you're, that you're estimating over, if the next derivative is bounded by some number here, uh, k sub n plus 1 means the bound on the n plus first derivative, then the error committed, the absolute value of the difference between f of x and its nth, polynom nth Taylor polynomial at x will be less than this. So in other words, if you pick an x in the interval containing x naught, you know that the error that the polynomial will commit in estimation is going to be less than or equal to the upper bound on that next derivative divided by n plus 1 factorial times the difference, the real difference, between x and x naught raised to the n plus first power. So what we're going to do today, well, we'll do an example with this first to make sure you see, but then we're going to just replace that n at the top with infinity and say, well, what, what kind of series are those? If we put, if I changed n here to infinity, we'd be looking at a power series, right? A coefficient times x minus x naught to the k. Well, what kind of power series is that? When does it converge? That's what we want to answer in 11.7. You've done plenty of examples like this in lab, but let's do one by hand just to make sure you understand Taylor polynomials. Uh, f of x is the square root of x, and x naught is equal to 4. 
So what we're going to do here, we know this is the square root of x, and let's say this is 4. We're going to find the p2, the quadratic approximation of this function, and see how good of a job it does at approximating the function at x equals the square root of 5. So let's see, to get this we're going to need, let's write it out, we're going to need f of 4 plus f prime of 4 times x minus 4 plus f double prime of 4 at times x minus 4, the quantity squared. That is, this is equal to p2 of x, the quadratic approximation, the second degree Taylor polynomial. Well, f of 4 is 2, and you can calculate this yourself. f prime of 4 is 1 fourth times x minus 4, plus, and f double prime, calculate it yourself on scratch paper. Whoops, it's negative, so that will be minus 1 over 32. I have, oh, excuse me, I have to divide by 2 factorial, which is negative 1 over 32 times x minus 4, the quantity squared. So this is p2 of x. Look back up here. When I wrote the coefficient of x minus 4 squared, I didn't divide by 2 factorial. So this is f of 4 over 0 factorial, f prime of 4 over 1 factorial, which I don't write in. But then when we get to the higher uh, derivatives, it's f upper k at x naught divided by k factorial. So we get this polynomial right here. That is our second degree Taylor polynomial, and you can check if I try to estimate 5 using the second degree Taylor polynomial, I get, plugging it into my calculator, 2.234375. Now if I take f of 5, which of course is the square root of 5, and put that in my calculator. We get an approximation, but it's 2.236068. So you see that the approximation is very good. In fact, the error, let's see, the error is always calculated as the absolute value of f of 5 minus p2 of 5. That's the actual error, so you just subtract, and uh, it is 0 0.001693. But keep in mind, this isn't a very realistic problem. This isn't the kind of problem you would be using, uh, that you would be doing if you needed a Taylor polynomial for approximation. If you need a Taylor polynomial for approximation, then it's not easy to plug uh, to plug 5 into the function. Here it's just a very simple example where we know f of 5. Certainly we wouldn't get a second degree polynomial to estimate f of 5 if we could just plug it into the function. But we can, and therefore we know the actual error committed. Usually you don't know how big the error is, and that is something that you need to know. So let's just pretend that we uh, don't know the error and that, it, that we can't plug 5 into the function easily. Then what we would do according to Taylor's theorem is uh, we use the second degree Taylor polynomial, so we would look at the third derivative at x, and just taking the third derivative, um, you get 3 eighths times x to the minus 5 halves or 3 eighths times 1 over the square root of x to the fifth. Now you know that this denominator is getting big. So as the denominator increases, we see that the function f, the third derivative, is decreasing on an interval containing uh, containing 4, so let's say on the interval 2, 6 maybe. 
it's decreasing everywhere as x increases from x equals 1. Or I could just say for x greater than 1. This function is decreasing. So we'll pick the interval 2, 6, just kind of arbitrarily. It's one that contains 4. And I could say that uh, the third derivative at x in absolute value is less than or equal to um, 3 over 8 times the square root of 2 to the fifth, which is 0 0.022. So that gives us an upper bound on the third derivative on an interval containing, uh, containing 4 and 5, what we were trying to estimate at f, f of 5. So this tells us then, according to let me circle this in green. We know that our third derivative is bounded, and that k3 we're going to use 0 0.022. And this tells us that the absolute value of the real f of 5 minus p2 of 5, I'm choosing 5 in that interval, will be less than or equal to 0 0.022 over 3 factorial times the absolute value of 5 minus 4, 1, and that cubed, and that is equal to 0 0.0036. Now, I could have used different interval than 2, 6. I could have taken the interval uh, 3, 3, 6 and used um, the third derivative at 3. This, this isn't too important. I just want you to see that we can find an upper bound on the third derivative, and therefore we know there's an upper bound on the limp, on the error. And we see that our actual area uh, error was well below this. Here's a, a graph. The black curve, that's y equals the square root of x. That's our f of x. And the red curve is the uh, quadratic approximation, p2 of x. And we centered it on x0 equals 4, right here, x0 equals 4. And let's see, just look at it. It looks like it does a pretty good job. Maybe f r the second degree does a pretty good job out to here, maybe. so. Looks pretty good between 2 point something, maybe 2.5 and 6. The second degree Taylor polynomial does a good job of approximating if we pick values of x close to 4, the one that we centered the polynomial at. OK, so let's replace in that for the function f of x centered at x0 equals 4, let's look at the series, the power series formed by instead of letting n go from 0 to 3 or 0 to 2, let's let it go 0 to infinity. The hardest part about this problem was trying to write it in sigma notation. so. Uh, I did it, and I don't expect you to be able to figure that all out. I, you could, but it would just take you some time. This is how we would write the series. Let's call it a Taylor series for f of x. In other words, by actually using the coefficients nth derivative at x0 divided by n factorial. So there it is. I couldn't get those first two terms in there using that notation. So I put 2, that's when n is 0. And when n is 1, you have 1 fourth times x minus 4. And then from n equals 2 on, this, um, this notation will, will do it for us. So let's take this and let's see 
uh, if it converges. All we know is that we're just doing like a Taylor polynoly polynomial, but we're letting n go to infinity. So it certainly is a power series. So let's take this and see, does it converge anywhere? Well, you're going to have to check this by hand because it really is uh, quite messy. Not messy, just uh, you have to think about it. All right, so let's see if this series converges. We don't even have to look at the first two terms. We're going to look at the ratio of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. So it's absolute value. Let me put a sub n plus 1 of x maybe over a sub n of x. We're going to take the absolute value of using the ratio test. All right, so the minus 1 to the n plus 1 goes because we're taking absolute value. I don't have to even consider that. And I'm going to, um, let's see, so when n, if I put n plus 1 in for n, I get 2 times n plus 1, or 2n plus 2 minus 3. So that's 2n minus 1. 2n minus 1, and then it goes down by 2. 2n minus 3, and on down to 5 times 3 times 1 over n plus 1 factorial times 2 to the 3n plus 3 minus 1 is 3n plus 2. Inverting and multiplying now, I'll have n factorial over 2 to the 3n minus 1 over, and again, we're not paying any attention to those minus 1 powers of minus 1 because we're taking absolute value. 2n minus 5 down to 5 times 3 times 1. And then we had x minus 4 to the n plus 1 over x minus 4 to the n, so we're just left with the absolute value of x minus 4. All right, well, now we should be able to do a lot of canceling here. You see the 2n minus 3 all the way down to 1 factors cancels with this entire denominator. And so we're left with here. Um, n factorial over n plus 1 factorial is 1 over n plus 1. And on the top we have 2n minus 1, 2n minus 1, I'll put those together. 2n minus 1 over 1 over n plus 1, or times 1 over n plus 1. And now I just have to subtract the exponents here, 3n plus 2 minus 3n minus 1 is 2 cubed, or 8, times the absolute value of x minus 4. All right, well, this uh, little rational function here, as n goes to infinity, that goes to the number 2, 2n over n. This is 1 8. So the limit here, arrow, is 1 fourth times the absolute value of x minus 4, which we know must be less than 1 in order for the series to converge. x has to be a number which makes this limit less than 1. So in other words, the va uh, x minus 4 in absolute value is less than 4. So x minus 4 is between 4 and negative 4. Adding 4 across, we get 0 is less than x is less than 8. So we find that this series converges on the interval 0, 8, and not outside of that interval. So let's just say out loud what we did again. We took the function f of x equals the square root of x, and instead of taking the Taylor polynomial, we made what we could call a Taylor series using the same coefficients, just letting n go to infinity. Now clearly it is a series, a power series, so we found that the, it is a power series that converges on 0, 8. It shouldn't really surprise us because we saw already just with the second degree polynomial 
that we had a pretty good estimate between 2.5 and, and 6. So it shouldn't be surprising that the series would converge on some interval containing the one that we, we saw with the graph. So you may be thinking at this point, oh no, another kind of series. Uh, maybe there's more than one power series for a function centered at some value of x. We might be asking, are there more ways than one to find a power series for a function f of x? So let's see. Let's suppose, let's just start with an arbitrary power series. A power series is this. It's a sum from k equals 0 to infinity uh, of a sub k, the coefficient, times x minus x naught to the k is a power series for f centered at x naught. That's what we learned in section, I believe, 11.5. So that's what it looks like. And what we're going to do now is see if we could solve for the coefficients. So let's, here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to write down a bunch of derivatives. And I have to write really small here. f prime of x would be, well, the first one drops out, so I just get a1 plus 2a2 times x minus x naught to the 1 plus 3a3 times x minus x naught squared plus 4a4 times x minus x naught cubed plus 5a5 five five times x minus x naught to the fourth plus and so on. All I'm doing is taking derivatives and then you're going to see something really surprising. Let's take the second derivative. So the second derivative, well, the a1 will drop out, and we have just 2a2 plus 3, oh, 3 times 2, let's write 3 factorial, a3 times x minus x naught plus 4 times 3, a4 times x minus x naught squared Randy? Oh, you guys, I'm so sorry. I left that on. <laughs> sorry about that. I can't start over. Um, plus, uh, where am I here? Oh, okay, 5 times 4, a sub 5 times x minus x naught cubed plus dot, dot, dot. And let's do the fourth derivative. f upper 4 of x is equal to, first term goes, uh, and we just have 3 factorial times a sub 3 plus, and we have 4, 3, 2, so let's say 4 factorial a to the 4, a 4 times x minus x naught plus 5 times 4 times 3 times x minus x naught squared dot dot dot, and one more, f, mm, Huh. 
The fifth derivative is, first term goes, 4 factorial a sub 4. Derivative of x minus x naught is just 1. Plus, now it'll be 5 factorial times x minus x naught plus dot dot dot. So take a look at those. Those are the derivatives. And you can see there's a pattern there. It's going to keep going. Uh, what is f of x naught? Well, f of x naught, look up here at our function f of x. When you plug in x naught, every single term from a, the first one on, from a1 on, is 0, because x naught minus x naught is 0. So f of x naught is a0. Well, what is f prime of x naught? Look at our derivative f prime. Every time you plug in x naught from here on, it's 0. So f prime of x naught is a1. How about f double prime of x naught? Looking here, f double prime of x naught, all of these terms go and we just have 2 a2. f triple prime, or f upper 3 at x naught, we see is 3 factorial times a3. And the fourth derivative at x naught is equal to Uh, you know what, up here I think I wrote that should have been 3 and this is 4. The fourth derivative at x of x naught, well, everything beyond there goes, and we have 4 factorial times a4. Well, what will the fifth derivative at x naught be? You can see that it is going to be 5 factorial times a sub 5, and so on. So what we have said is here is that if you have a power series for a function f, we're not saying where it converges, but the power series for f centered at some number x naught must have this relationship between the derivatives and the coefficients of the series. In fact, a, a0 is f of x naught, a1 is f prime of x naught, and look, a2, this, the coefficient of x minus x naught squared, is f double prime evaluated at x naught divided by 2 factorial. a3 is f triple prime at x naught divided by 3 factorial a4 is the fourth derivative of the function evaluated at x naught divided by 4 factorial. And I think that we could say something in general now. We can say that if f of x, if we form the, if f of x is continuously differentiable, then it makes sense we could write well, we could write a power series centered at x naught, and if this power series exists, if we can do this, we know that the coefficient, the kth coefficient, is the kth derivative at x naught divided by k factorial. That's what we just proved. If there exists a power series to represent a function f of x, it has to be continuously differentiable function, and the coefficients of the power series are simply the kth derivative over k factorial. So our function f of x is represented by 
the a series called the Taylor series. k equals 0 to infinity. The kth derivative evaluated at x naught over k factorial times x minus x naught to the k. This is the power series for f of x. We're not saying whether it converges on anything other than x naught itself, but that is the power series for f of x, the only one centered at x naught, and it happens to be the Taylor series. So we now have a recipe for finding the coefficients of power series. You don't have to always see them as a derivative or an integral of a power series that you already know. My goodness, we only know five or six power series. So it's not always function composition with one of those or um, a derivative or an integral of one of those. These series are called Taylor series. If x naught is zero, that's called the Maclaurin series, and most of the ones that we will look at in Calc 2, that we have looked at or will look at, <coughs> are Maclaurin series. In other words, they are the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of the kth derivative evaluated at 0 over k factorial times x to the k, x minus 0. These are Maclaurin series. So uh, let's write, write that out uh, in long ways. It's f, oh, that's a phone again. The Maclaurin series will be written as f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial times x squared plus f triple prime at 0 over 3 factorial x cubed and so on. And it's a Maclaurin series that we will, anything I'd ask you on the test would be a Maclaurin series. If f has a power series that converges to it on an interval, then its coefficients are necessarily the ones that we just solved for. When we convinced ourselves that the series sigma uh, x to the n over n factorial was the series for e to the x, uh, we started with the series and we proved that it was a solution to a differential equation uh, y equals y prime. So we started with the series, I think we called it s of x, the series, sigma x to the n over n factorial. And we showed that this series, this function, was a solution to the differential equation y equals y prime and that y of 0 was 1. Therefore, we said, oh, it has to be e to the x. But now I'm going to show you how we can start with the function e to the x and use the uh, Maclaurin series definition to actually solve for the coefficients of the series for e to the x. So we need some derivatives. Well, we know that every derivative, f upper n of x, is equal to e to the x. So this one's really easy. We know that the nth derivative for any value of n at 0 is equal to e to the 0 or 1. So we know all the derivatives at 0, and therefore f upper n of 0 over n factorial is equal to 1 over n factorial. And our Maclaurin series will be the sum from uh, n equals 0 to infinity of f upper n at 0 over n factorial x to the n, which in this case is, because these are all just 1, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial times x to the n. That is, and we know that it converges using the, the ratio test on the entire real number line. And it is equal to e to the x. And the last example I'd like to do is to find, to derive the uh, Maclaurin series for sine x.
series that you already know. And before we were given the series, let's see, it was uh, the sum from minus 1 to the n over uh, 2n plus 1 factorial times x to the 2n plus 1 from n equals 0 to infinity. We started with this and we showed that it was a solution to the differential equation y equals minus y double prime. And uh, we plugged in a value and an initial value and we found that it had to be sine x. But let's derive the coefficients. So we need some derivatives. Uh, f of x is sine x. f prime of x is equal to cosine x. f double prime of x is equal to minus sine x. f triple prime, or f3 of x, is equal to minus the cosine of x. And we get, then we keep going. We say, oh, well then, the, the fourth derivative is back to f of x, and the fifth derivative is cosine x, the sixth derivative is minus sine x, the seventh derivative is minus cosine x, and so on. We're going to get the eighth derivative is back to sine x, and the ninth derivative, and so on. So we, we have uh, four different possibilities for the derivative. So what we want is the Taylor, se the Maclaurin series. So we want f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial x squared plus f triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial times x cubed Let's write one more. The fourth derivative at 0 over 4 factorial times x to the fourth uh, plus, I do one more, the fifth derivative at 0 over 5 factorial times x to the fifth plus dot dot dot. So we just have to plug in 0 to these derivatives. So the sine of 0 is 0 plus f prime of 0, cosine 0, is 1 times x, plus f double prime of 0. Well, that's back to the minus the sine of 0, so that's going to be 0. Plus f triple prime of 0 is minus 1. So we have minus 1 times x, oh, over, th excuse me, over 3 factorial, times x cubed. Well, the fourth derivative will be 0 again, so we don't need to divide it by 4 factorial. Plus, the fifth derivative is cosine, so that's going to be plus 1 over 5 factorial, x to the fifth. And it's going to keep going like this. We're going to get plus 0, and then we're going to have minus 1 um, over 7 factorial, x to the seventh, plus, and so on. So you see that well, these zeros don't, don't count, so we have x minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh plus dot 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 and that's exactly what we know is true. Minus 1, here's our series up here in the corner, minus 1 to the n starting at 0. So when, when n is 0, we have minus 1 to the 0 over 1 factorial times x. That's correct up here. When n is 1, we get minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed. It's exactly cosine x. So you can see how we can actually solve for coefficients of a Taylor or Maclaurin series if 
it's fairly easy to take derivatives. Often you can't find a pattern in the derivatives. But who cares? You could find the first four coefficients and probably get a polynomial that does a very good job of approximation. Sorry for all the interruptions. Um, I certainly don't want to do this again on a holiday. <laughs>